So the Canadian political spectrum, this is one that people have been asking me for for a long time. I had done it before now just because I've had to do a lot of thinking about this and some research. And even then, I'm going to get a lot of stuff wrong and I'm going to extrapolate a bunch. Canadian politics is an extremely complicated and uninteresting affair, largely, because the differences between the parties are sometimes ideological, but more often they're a cultural class or I guess you could even say ethnic issue rather than any real policy difference. For most of the country's history, the progressive conservatives and federal liberals were very similar. It was more kind of what the political culture of each party was and what part of the country, country they represented rather than anything really that ideological separate. So when Canada was founded, we had two main political parties which persist in one form or another up to the present. We had the Liberal Party, which was known as Parti Rouge in Quebec, and the Conservative Party known as Parti Bleu in Quebec. So obviously they were modeled off of the Tory party in Britain and the Liberal Party in Britain. Uh, the Whigs had disappeared by that point. I guess the Tories had become the Conservatives in Canada, but it's still very common in Canada to refer to Conservatives as Tories, uh, to members of the or supporters of the Conservative Party as Tories. It's, it's pretty much synonymous and it's very commonly used here. So generally speaking, how you can differentiate the Liberal and Conservative Party is the Conservative Party is traditionally the party of Anglos. And it's important to keep in mind within the context of Canada, Scots are just considered Anglo. Um, if, if someone's Scottish, they generally, they might say they're Scottish, but generally speaking, everyone just considers them English. Uh, our first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, most people just say English or British or something. There, there's not really a distinction made. So the Conservative Party was the party of the Anglos, the upper class, the upper middle class, people who worked in kind of professional fields, traditionally. And they were characterized by a very strong loyalty to Britain. They were kind of the most hesitant about becoming an independent country almost. And they continually, to this day, want to maintain close ties to Britain. They want our system of government and our culture to more closely resemble Britain. And they oppose any attempt to remove the monarchy. The Liberal Party, on the other hand, is was traditionally the party of French Canada. And it was for most of Canada's history. It was a party that was opposed to ties with Britain. It wanted to develop its own Canadian identity be that something unique or something multicultural or something even kind of French-based to a certain extent. But they, to this day, resent ties to the British monarchy and often show outright contempt for it and dislike British symbolism. They want Canada to be a completely separate society with no real ties to the mother country. There's also a religious element here where the Tories were traditionally the party of Protestants to the point that anti-Catholicism was not uncommon, whereas Catholics would vote for the Liberal Party. It wasn't any real ideological thing, it was just kind of where they were based in the country. And that's changed a bit over time, but not a ton. The Conservatives still do best in provinces with virtually no French speakers, whereas the Liberals continue to do well in the East Coast, Eastern Ontario, and Quebec. So. So the Conservative Party of Canada is kind of an interesting chimera in its various forms. I'd say kind of the two dominant strains of it are High Toryism, which eventually became Red Toryism. High Toryism is very succinctly put kind of right-wing paternalism. It's it's kind of it's combining a lot of I guess you could say left-wing economic ideals like welfare, labor standards, that sort of thing with hierarchy and uh, right-wing political thought. but And that was a very common trait in the Conservative Party because the Conservative Party occasionally ran almost to the left of the Liberal Party prior to the 1980s in terms of what their economic policies were. They're also very much in favor of stuff like tariffs and things like that because traditionally Conservatives have been for protectionism 
in most Anglo countries, and liberals have been for free trade. Actually, that's also true in other countries. It's it's confusing because liberal and conservative mean something completely different in Canada, America, and Britain to a certain extent than they do in every other country on earth. Whereas liberalism is considered the center right in European countries, whereas in Canada and America, it's kind of the center left. But I digress. So yeah, so that was fairly common. And eventually what that became was what we call red Toryism. Red Toryism today is basically this identical to center left liberalism. It's social left to social far left and economically center left, although they can be slightly more free market than the actual supposedly left wing parties. But there's no functional difference between it. And red Tories are widely despised in most of the parties that they're part of, even if they often take a, a dominant role. Then you also had the more libertarian, more free market, more kind of populist faction, which is very common out West, which also tended to be more socially conservative. I guess you could kind of think of them as being a extremely watered down form of kind of red state Republicans, kind of like populist, man of the people, people who tend to come from rural areas, people who are more conser uh, socially conservative and religious. And those have always kind of been the two major factions, I'd say, within the Conservative Party. And they've been kind of, one's been dominant over the other. And once we get to the 1980s, we have the emergence of the neoliberal faction, which kind of takes almost libertarian views on economics. That really becomes prominent in the 1980s and 1990s. And in most of Canada, you see the what's called kind of the blue Tory faction or the kind of populist conservatism largely just disappear and most cons most conservative parties look like provincial ones only kind of have the center left conservatives and kind of the more libertarian socially liberal conservatives left the liberal party I, I think the best way to describe the liberal party is it's an amalgamation of people who want to get elected at all costs now they'll call it centrism or pragmatism but generally speaking, the liberal parties of Canada don't have anything resembling a coherent ideology. It's almost solely based on whatever the leader says and almost solely based on whatever they think will get them elected. So it's not uncommon for liberal parties to take left wing ideas and I guess you could say right wing in the sense of economic like free market ideas and kind of combine them together. There's, there's often kind of an incoherent mixture of them. It's whatever they think will get them another term in office, they will just promise the public. And they they view their lack of kind of a coherent political program or ideology as a benefit, but a lot of people who are more principled don't really like them. So it's not uncommon for people such as myself would rather vote for the NDP or the Socialist Party rather than the Liberals, if not the Conservatives, because they view them as having a more coherent ideology if that makes any sense. So you had periods where the Liberal Party was more left-wing and almost kind of a socialist party, like under uh, Pierre Trudeau. And then you had periods where the Liberal Party was more economically free market than the Conservative Party during the 1990s. And now we have a period where the Liberal Party has become a far left party under Justin Trudeau socially. So they basically they can be socially center left to socially far left and economically centrist to even center right to economically left. They basically occupy every position on the political spectrum with the exception of centrist or center right views on social matters. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. So what kind of happened over time with the various parties is the conservatives dominated early Canada, but as the country grew, the liberals more or less took over. For the vast majority of Canada's history, the Liberal Party has been in power. I believe William Lyon Mackenzie King was in power for something like 20 to 30 years. Louis Saint Laurent was also in power for like 15 to 20 years. Pierre Elliott Trudeau was in power for like 15 to 20 years. More or less, it used to be that every single leader of the Liberal Party had served as Prime Minister of Canada. 
and that was true up until the 2000s. Uh, they just utterly dominated politics in the country. Traditionally, Ontario and some of the prairie provinces would vote conservative, and then you'd have the liberals who would dominate in Quebec and the East Coast. Now, while Quebec is only about a third of Canada's population, Quebec votes very much as a block. So you'll have cases where they would vote entirely conservative or vote entirely liberal, and they would they continue to hold the balance of power in Canada. Um, the Conservative Party only won a majority in the election before this one because the vote in Quebec swung for the NDP. So, yeah, the the, uh, the Liberal Party of Canada's fortunes have been tied very much to how much Quebec supports them. So. During the 1930s or 40s, I believe it was, we had the emergence of the the CCF or the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, which was kind of our rough equivalent of the Labour Party. Now, unlike socialist movements in some other countries, the CCF, from my understanding at least and from the research I've done, largely started out as a Christian socialist movement. Probably the most famous member of the CCF, which would eventually become the NDP, was Tommy Douglas, who was actually a Baptist minister before he became the Premier of Saskatchewan. So the NDP for a long time was kind of the working man's party. It was the party of people who worked outdoors, you know, union trade unions, that sort of thing. So while it always took kind of left-wing views on social issues, there was a limit to how far it could go because working class people tend to be pretty conservative in terms of, of social issues and that sort of thing. So once again, we're kind of getting into the, the nitty gritty of social class in term, as opposed to ideology. So generally speaking, if you were an urbanite, or kind of a cosmopolitan, you would vote liberal. If you lived in the suburbs, you would either vote liberal or conservative. If you lived in rural areas, you would either vote conservative or NDP. The Liberal Party has never had any real appeal to people in rural areas. In Western Canada, like Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, you would have NDP governments and you would have conservative governments. The Liberal parties in some of those provinces don't exist anymore because the Liberal Party has nothing to offer rural people. Farmers like the NDP because they like things like uh, set prices for their goods, uh, public welfare, that kind of thing. And, and that's something I think you find in most countries where you'll have the farmers will vote for a socialist party, they'll vote for a conservative party, but they aren't interested in, in a liberal party. So you have the conservatives who in modern day have most of their support in suburbs and among, I guess you could say, the middle class. Although as with most Western countries, the working class is increasingly voting conservative. That's something you have in America, Britain, and a lot of European countries where the white working class is abandoning socialist parties and increasingly voting for conservative parties for identity and, and social issues. That's where you had like the blue dog Democrats who were socially conservative, patriotic, working class people who voted Democrat for economic reasons. But after Reagan, they started to vote Republican. It should also be noted that immigrants vote overwhelmingly liberal. Some of them vote for the NDP, but in general, the NDP and the conservatives don't have a lot to offer immigrants. And in fact, the Liberal Party has increased immigration enormously, partially for the purpose of transforming the demographics of the country to make sure they can win every election. Muslims, I think, vote like 78, like 60, 70 percent for the Liberal Party. I think less than 10 percent vote conservative. The only minority that until the last election, I believe, voted conservative were Hindus. But I think even they vote majority liberal now. <clears throat> Minorities in Canada are almost always more left-wing socially than the, even Muslims are more left-wing socially than the, the white population. It's just kind of the way it is.
So we kind of move through that and kind of where one of the big shifts happens during the 1980s. Because during the 1980s, you have the coming to power of Brian Mulroney as the head of the Conservative Party. Now, Brian Mulroney was a Irishman from Quebec. Uh, if I recall correctly, he was half Irish, half French. Mulroney obviously being an Irish name. Uh, there, there's a lot of Irish who moved to Quebec and integrated because they're both Catholic. So it's not uncommon to, I believe Pierre Trudeau was also half Irish, half French. So it's not uncommon for there to be that in, in Quebec. The Irish largely just integrated. Uh, they learned French. Some of them took French names. They married into French families. And because they were Catholic, it wasn't that big a deal for them to just integrate. Uh, the other Irish province in Canada is Newfoundland, which is overwhelmingly Irish. And it's it's made fun of by the rest of Canada because the Anglo influences there just don't like the Irish. And that's kind of an old world beef that carries over to the new world, I guess you could say. So when Brian Mulroney became head of the Conservative Party, it shifted very uh, far leftward. Uh, sorry, right. Uh, blah, blah, blah. It, it abandoned most of its socially conservative policies and became a neoliberal party that dramatically cut taxes and spending. No, sorry, well, taxes, but not really spending. As with most neoliberal governments, they cut taxes, but didn't cut spending. They cut services, but not, it's it's weird. Uh, kind of like the George Bush era, and it just massively ran up the debt. Because Brian Mulroney was a, how'd you put it, a, um, a Quebecer, Quebec voted overwhelmingly for him, and Brian Mulroney had the largest majority in Canadian history. He actually got over 50% of the popular vote, which is unheard of. And I don't think anyone since has even come vaguely close to that. So he more or less completely ruled the country. However, what wound up happening was his coalition became increasingly irritable. Western Canada viewed him as kind of a cosmopolitan liberal elitist, and Quebec viewed him as kind of a sellout who had abandoned Quebecer identity. So as we get to the, 1990, the 1993 election, you had the Conservative Party break up into basically three pieces. There was the Rump Progressive Conservative Party, the Reform Party, which is basically every all the Western Canada became um, part of, and then the Bloc Québécois, who we'll talk about in a minute. But the Conservative Party went from a majority government with 156 seats to having only two seats left. <clears throat> they lost that much in one election. They, they effectively ceased to exist as a party, and they would remain only marginal for the rest of their existence. So let's just maybe back up a bit and let's talk a bit about, as of the 1990s, kind of what the... Let's take a bit of a look at this, uh, the graph we have here. So um, I have a chart over on the other side where I have kind of what I refer to as the ideologies of the different parties. So the Liberal Party prior to the 1990s, uh, where is, did I put the Liberal Party pre-1990s, was, uh, I think you have to understand, probably the most common thread in Canadian politics, and this is going to sound weird, is nationalism. Canada's an interesting case in which jingoism, and I use that term unironically, like extreme, extreme negative nationalism, hating things that isn't Canadian, and self-hatred are somehow mutually compatible. If you watch Canadian news, it's it's... It's like almost watching North Korea news sometimes. Like if there's any disaster or catastrophe, like in Vegas, all they would talk about is like the two Canadians who died. They were like, fuck the other people who died. We don't care about them. If there's an earthquake or something, thousands of people could die. And they'll only talk about the Canadians. Uh, they'll very often say we're the, only, we're the best country on earth. We're the only tolerant country on earth. We're the only country on earth with human rights. Part of Canadian identity is hating America. Uh, people in Canada, it's not uncommon for people to say we should just kill Americans. Uh, they're the worst people on earth. We despise them. And I think that's largely because there isn't really a substantial difference between Anglo-Canadians. I think another just note on Anglo-Canadian. The definition of an Anglo-Canadian has grown to include Germans, 
pretty much any white person who speaks English as a first language is, is an Anglo-Canadian today. Um, there isn't really a meaningful difference between, in most of the country, between people who are ethnically English, such as myself, and even people who are like Ukrainian. Like, in Saskatchewan, we had Brad Wall, who was a Baptist Mennonite, um, but was still, I, I would say, widely considered to be Anglo-Canadian. So, yeah, so you have this mixture of extreme, extreme nationalism, and I use that term completely unironically, with self-hatred. So the Liberal Party of Canada, I describe as having, uh, being a, prior to the 1990s, as being a left-wing political party whose main ideology was liberal nationalism. Liberal nationalism is the idea that the identity of the nation is liberalism. So tolerance, um, progressivism, human rights, and I mean that sarcastically, multiculturalism, basically that the identity of the country is a lack of an identity, and basically just left-wing political ideology, specifically liberalism as opposed to socialist patriotism, is the identity of the country. It kind of ensues um, actual identity, like cultural, ethnic, linguistic, in favor of replacing that with the identity of the country is, is functionally identical to liberalism. And a lot of Canadian history has been rewritten by the Liberal Party to reflect the idea that can Canadian identity isn't British or French, it's just liberal, and it always has been. That That's kind of something we had in the Soviet Union, where, to a large extent, I think justifiably, they took the perspective that communism was the Russian tradition, and it was kind of the, the legitimate or logical successor to czarism, which I think has a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, how can you put it, merit. So the Liberal Party would describe as a liberal nationalist party, and the internal factions were social liberal and social democracy. Some were more socially progressive, some were more socially centrist, and eventually we had, uh, like, national pharma health care and a lot of other what we probably call today socialist reforms carried out under the liberal party so we had them kind of around here during the pre-1990s they were somewhat left-wing um socially by canadian standards they weren't a ton if you look at this you'll notice that the right-wing area is almost barren and the parties here don't exist anymore so they were that, and they were somewhat socialist, not like that strongly socialist. So then from there, we move into the 1990s Liberal Party, where they moved substantially further to the left on, on uh, social issues, but became much, much more free market. So during the 1990s, we had Gretchen and Martin, and they legalized gay marriage, vastly increased immigration, and did all kinds of other cultural revolutions. At the same time, though, in contrast to Brian Mulroney, they both cut taxes and dramatically reduced spending. The 1990s were one of the few periods in Canadian history where the federal debt actually was going down as a percentage of GDP and in absolute numbers. They completely throttled, um, I guess, the growth of government and implemented a very... Uh, a lot of austerity and stuff. And the 1990s are generally considered to be one of the most prosperous eras in Canadian history where there is just a bonanza of growth and the country's finances were very healthy, the banking system was strong. So you had that time period. Eventually, during the 2000s, you'd have a, a crisis of confidence where the Liberals would go through a whole bunch of different leaders, Martin, Ignatieff, and Dion, before coming to Justin Trudeau. So I call the, the Liberal Party of the 1990s, let me see here, a, I'd still call them a far left party, not as far left as they'd eventually become, but their main ideology was, had kind of shifted from liberal nationalism to neoliberalism with strong social liberal, classical liberal and liberal nationalist factions. Social democracy had largely ceased to have any meaning. 
within the federal liberal party during this time period then we head into the the um the the kind of the post the 2000s onward with justin trudeau in which the liberal party became a truly far left party i would say that the main ideology of the liberal party today is either social liberalism or just straight out social justice uh, you have justin trudeau who's probably the single most radical person to ever lead a western country one of his first actions was to expel everybody from the liberal party who was pro-life uh, he is the most radically pro-abortion prime minister of pretty much any country uh, he won't even say abortion is morally questionable he doesn't even say it's a necessary evil he has called Canada post-nation. He said there's no Canadian identity. He just shows open contempt for the entire process of the country. Um, he keeps taking off his shirt in public. He just does, like, he does yoga poses. He's just a goof. He's, he's it's hard to even, I, I don't really pay attention to federal politics that often because it's too depressing. So the Liberal Party of today has become somewhat more socialist again. But mainly their economic policies are largely just meant to punish the white population, I'd say. Like they've implement, like they got rid of, also it's just incoherent. I think at the moment what they're trying to do is they're trying to change the small business taxes to hurt small businesses, but they're thinking of only applying the tax changes to males because they want to bring about income equality. So next we have the conservative party that's gone through a lot of change over time. So you had the, the Conservative Party, which eventually merged with the Progressive Party and became the Progressive Conservative Party, which was very similar to the Liberal Party. I would say that their ideology was Canadian nationalism, probably more cultural nationalism. They emphasized the, the British nature of Canada and wanted to preserve that. So it wasn't quite liberal nationalism. There was aspects of that. It was more just kind of Canadian nationalism with also aspects of of um, Anglo in, Anglo interest, liberal conservatism, etc. So where do I have the pre nineties PC? Yeah, so national C PC pre eighties. They were still somewhat socialist compared to most Western conservative parties, but they were a lot more socially right wing than they would become later. So after it collapsed, you had the Reform Party, which emerged in the West. Now, the Reform Party were a populist party that was very much kind of an evangelical conservative party, socially conservative. It was farmers and middle class and small business owners from the western part of the country. And the Reform Party was substantially to the right of the old PC party, and it's one of the few parties I'd actually say was right wing in Canadian history. However, it never had any of kind of a holding outside of the West. Vote splitting among the ostensibly right-wing vote meant that neither the PCs nor the Alliance could really gain seats outside of uh, their respective areas. In Ontario, the vote was split very evenly. And in the East Coast, it was a complete disaster. Not that many people voted Alliance there, but enough did to kind of screw up their chances. Also, it divided the donor base, etc. <clears throat> the Quebec wing of the Conservative Party is, is a bit more interesting. Uh, the Bloqué Québécois is ostensibly a left-wing socialist party, but I call them a centrist party, um, or sorry, a center-left party. Their main ideology is Quebec civic nationalism, specifically separatism. Uh, they want to preserve Quebec identity. They want money given to Quebec kind of at the expense of the rest of Canada. And they're kind of a mixture. Of, they're a very strange mix because they have socialists and leftists, but they also have rural conservatives who vote for them. So while they're technically a left wing party, they're not nearly as socially left wing as a lot of the other federal parties at this point in time because their base is a very mixed bag. We'll get into Quebec politics in a minute, but that's kind of how things things work very differently there than in the rest of the country. So then you had the NDP, which started out as a, a kind of a Christian socialist party, and then it became kind of a socialist party, 
and then under Mulcair in, in kind of the last two elections it became kind of almost a center left party Mulcair was initially approached by the conservatives to run in Quebec actually but he eventually just became the head of the NDP and ran for it what had kind of happened and why the Conservatives eventually got a majority government was Quebec switched from supporting the Bloc and the Liberal Party to supporting the NDP en masse. And the NDP, prior to Justin, was actually the official opposition for a period of time. Actually, in the aftermath of the 1993 election, the Bloc won basically every seat in Quebec and became the official opposition for a time. Which is interesting that a regional party got that powerful. So the NDP, as of like a couple weeks after, before I wrote this, have elected a, a Sikh leader who is substantially to the left of everybody, maybe even to the left of Justin Trudeau on social issues and as socialist, if not more socialist, on economic issues. So that's kind of the state of, so that eventually what happened with the Federal Conservative Party is the Alliance Party, which was the successor of the Reform Party, and the PC Party merged to make the Conservative Party of Canada, which is I would identify as a center-left party. That is a weird mixture of stuff. It's kind of a big tent party. I'd say its main ideology is Canadian nationalism, kind of a mixture of liberal and cultural nationalism. It is uh, a mixture of liberal conservatives, social conservatives, red, lib red Tories, right libertarians, and classical liberals. Overall, it's definitely a socially liberal party, and it's, it's somewhat free market. But it's, it's like all Western conservative parties, it would be considered left-wing, not even center-left, but left-wing compared to parties like even 30 years ago. It's probably to the left of the Liberal Party in like the 1940s and 50s on most issues. So that's kind of how it works federally. We've gone through different kind of eras. You have people who kind of represent the right of the Conservative Party on different issues, like Kelly Leach represented the Canadian Nationalist faction. Brad Troust represented the Social Conservative faction. Maxine Bernier was kind of the right libertarian faction. And then you had Lisa Raitt, and who was kind of the the liberal faction. So there's kind of left and right wing factions of of the different groups. Andrew Shear was kind of the center right faction of the Tory party because he was to the right of most of the candidates, but to the left of Kelly Leach and Brad Troust, and he's kind of the big tent guy of the party. And he kind of won because most people can, most people took him as their second choice because he was kind of the most similar, because he was kind of in the middle ground. So that's how it works in Canada. So let's talk a bit about parties in the different regions. So in Ontario, it tends to go back and forth between periods of conservative and liberal dominance. For a very long time in Ontario, the progressive conservatives governed as kind of a centrist or center-left party um, under what was called the Big Blue Machine, where they more or less won every election. Eventually, that would kind of fall apart and you'd have a liberal government and then eventually an NDP government who, combined with kind of the early 90s recession and bad economic planning, led the province into a, a huge, just kind of disastrous economic situation. The PC party almost went underwent a refounding during the 1990s with what would become known as the common sense revolution in which they adopted radical neoliberalism. Uh, the road to serfdom was made required reading for most party officials during this time period and spending and taxes were cut by about 30%. Um, there was severe tax and spending cuts. You had a lot of new policies coming in, kind of the reformatting of a lot of the school boards, a lot of the civil service had a lot of changes, that sort of thing. The Conservatives almost became a right libertarian party during this time period. So eventually, despite, I, I think in a lot of ways, successful economic policies, that government completely collapsed and the Liberals came to power and they've been in power, I think it's four terms now, like 16 years. And you had Dalton McGuinty, who was very left-wing, and now you have Kathleen Wynne, who's radically left-wing. And I would say the, the Liberal Party of Ontario is basically just a social justice party at this point in time. Um, 
maybe I'll get into that some other time, but I would say they're probably the most left-wing party in Canada. Just just listen to the stuff they say sometime. They support Black Lives Matter. They're they're just awful. I don't even really want to talk about them, but they've done that. They've also gone further and further socialist on economic issues. Like they're implementing a $15 minimum wage. They're increasing, they've doubled the size of the civil service in like an eight year period. Uh, the province is in a complete mess financially and economically under their mismanagement. However, they are willing to just implement policies that are not sustainable, like the minimum wage increase, like they have this this choo-choo train to know where they're trying to do. Uh, they said they were going to build these gas plants and then didn't. And basically, their entire thing at this point is just trying to get reelected. And they'll just figure out whatever policies people like, regardless of their cost and feasibility, and say they're going to implement them to get another term in office. And that's basically the Liberal Party. Uh, the PC Party post Harris has become increasingly left wing. It, it almost went kind of back to the right under Tim Hudak, but now we have Patrick Brown, who's a really sleazy guy and is very, very left wing. He, he kind of ran for office on being a social conservative, but now he's in power. He said that anybody who is opposes the new sex ed curriculum should vote elsewhere. And he's so abrasive to the, the center, uh, to the right wing and even the center wing of the party that people are leaving in droves. And we're seeing, we've seen a new right wing party emerge in Ontario, the Trillium Party, and they're just hemorrhaging support. There's a financial crisis, but he just continues to go further and further left. So now we have an interesting scenario where the NDP in Ontario is actually to the right of the PCs, both socially and economically. Under Andrea Horvath, the NDP has kind of taken a centrist position. They, they don't really talk about identity politics much. They mainly just talk about solutions for working families. And now they're proposing like investment tax cuts, incentives for businesses, and that sort of thing. They've actually become more pro-free market than the Tories are. And they've become less kind of social justice-y. I'm sure if they got in power, they'd be more social justice-y. But their rhetoric is a lot more right-wing, and I use that term sarcastically, than the, the Tory party is. <clears throat> so as we head into the new election, we have a far-left party, a left, uh, what, what I call a left-wing party, and a center-left party. Ironically, it's the Socialist Party that's become the center-left party. So, looking at the other parts of Canada, on the East Coast, it's pretty much liberal-dominant because the liberals tend to be more in favor of centralization and a stronger federal government. And because the East Coast is very economically underdeveloped, they get a lot of funds from the central government and want it as big and strong as possible. Conservatives occasionally win in the East Coast, particularly under Danny Williams, but in general, it's it's pretty much a liberal stronghold. Quebec is really weird politically. Basically, in Quebec, there's three main parties. There's the Liberal Party of Quebec, there's the Parti Quebecois, and there's the ADQ, or whatever it's called these days. So in Quebec, historically... It was governed by the Union Nationale, who was probably the most right-wing party in the history of Canada. The Union Nationale was a, a right-wing, uh, conservative, almost reactionary party that was the Quebec Nationalist Party, but didn't want to secede. They just wanted autonomy for Quebec. They were radically anti-communist and very, very strongly pro-Catholic. They wanted to maintain the French cultural, and I'd almost say ethnic character of Quebec, and maintain the central role of the Catholic Church in various institutions. The, the issue with them was Quebec was very underdeveloped compared to the rest of Canada. Uh, they were very hard on unions, partially because of almost paranoid anti-communism, and their focus on kind of parochial education and a traditional way of life meant Quebec was very under-industrialized, its economy very underdeveloped, and the school system pretty far behind in terms of technical education. 
compared to the rest of the country. So Quebec underwent the Quiet Revolution in which the right basically died in Quebec. You had places where mass attendance fell 80% in a, uh, within a decade and Quebec became the most left-wing part of North America. In some ways, the left of uh, BC and California. And, uh, California. So within Quebec, it's today kind of split up between federalist and nationalist parties and kind of in between. Federalist parties are Canadian nationalists and they want to keep Quebec part of Canada. Nationalist parties want Quebec to separate. So the Parte Quebecois wants to separate. Quebec's had two referendums, which were pretty sure the Federalists rigged uh, to make it stay part of Canada. So you have those two parties. You also have a third party, which is the ADQ, which is somewhere in between. It is ostensibly the Conservative Party, but in practice, it's a socially liberal party that's slightly less socialist. The Liberal Party of Quebec is less socialists and the other parties but Quebec is the most socialist province so take that for what it's worth the Parti Quebecois is ostensibly a socialist party but it has a very large conservative base conservatives in Quebec vote for a bunch of different parties but if there is a far right in Quebec it probably votes for the Parti Quebecois because it is very much a it used to be a cultural nationalist party but now it's more of, I'd say, a linguistic nationalist party. So a common refrain in Quebec today is English out, Haitians in, civic. Quebec really hates Anglos. It hates other minorities who learn English as their first language, but they like Haitians and Africans who speak French. So last time I was in Montreal, there are Haitians everywhere, and they're trying to bring more and more in because they've even really abandoned the idea of culture and they just solely believe Quebec identity is linguistic. Quebec has really strong anti-English laws and Quebec is not bilingual. In fact, in a lot of places, the signs aren't bilingual. They're only in French. If you go to France, there's more bilingualism there than in Quebec. So that's kind of how Quebec works. It's really weird. So heading to Western Canada, you, you tend to have a, a thing there where there's no Liberal Party. There is just a NDP party and a Conservative Party. In Saskatchewan, the rump of the Liberal Party joined with the Conservative Party to make the Saskatchewan Party. The NDP had been in power of Saskatchewan for like 30 years, and eventually they were moved from power, and now Saskatchewan has a dominant party system the other way where the Saskatchewan Party basically will just win forever or win for a long period of time. In Manitoba, it was basically just the NDP and, and the Conservatives, and they kind of have been trading power. In Alberta, you have a case where parties tend to be in power for about 30 years of peace, and then they collapse and just vanish. So you had the United Farmers, which was actually a farmers union that was in power for a long period of time. Then I think you had the Liberal Party. Then you had the Social Credit Party, I'll have to look, do more research into social credit, but social credit was basically political Protestantism, I guess is the best way to describe it. It was a actually left-wing, uh, actually a right-wing party that was socially conservative. They had this whole idea of social credit, which is, I think, like distributism. It's very complex. It was invented by an engineer who was also like an evangelical Christian. I have to try and figure it out at some point. I just, I, I've never really gotten around to it. But it collapsed, and then you had the Progressive Conservative Party, who was in power for like almost 40 years, I think. And recently, they completely collapsed and were replaced by the NDP. So now you have a case in, in, in uh, Alberta where you, have the, you had the Wild Rose Party, which was kind of the heir to the alliance, kind of a populist, more rural-based much more right-wing party than the PCs. You don't have a liberal party in Alberta. Most of them probably just vote for the PCs. And the NDP and the NDP are in power at the moment. However, the PCs and Wild Rose merged to form the United Conservative Party. And the United Conservative Party, we don't really know what their identity was. At the time, though, the Wild Rose was bigger because uh, they got more seats in the last election. So we're going to see what comes out of that. But they're polling really, really high, and they'll probably win majorities for the foreseeable future. 
Then we get to BC, and in BC, the Conservative Party, Social Credit was in power for a while, but the Conservative Party merged into the uh, the Liberal Party. So the Liberal Party of BC is not um, affiliated with the Federal Liberal Party. It's rough. It's, I think, 60% Liberal, 40% Conservative is its voter base. And it just tends, they refer to themselves as being the free market coalition. Basically, they're right in center wing of the Liberal Party, merged with the, the Provincial Conservative Party to make the Liberal Party of, of BC. And the left wing of the Liberal Party joined the NDP. And it's very close there. It also has the strongest Green Party. It's a bit like California. The coast is among the most left wing parts of Canada, but the interior is pretty right wing and like the north of the province. So... That's basically, I think, a rundown of the Canadian political spectrum of the various provinces and, and federally. Um, if you have any more questions, I can maybe do another video. But that is, I think, long enough. And I think that covers something I've been saying I'm going to do for a long time. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll talk to you guys later.